Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining me. These are the readings and sermons for Sunday, March 21st, the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that next Sunday is Palm Sunday and weather permitting at all of our churches at the beginning of our service, we will gather outside for a reading of the processional gospel and a blessing of palms and then we will process into the church with the palms as we sing our opening hymn. So with that said, let us begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. O God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. A reading from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer will they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now a reading from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Our second reading is a reading from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. A reading from Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 23. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. 
they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If a label were be given to the people of the 21st century so far, I think an appropriate one would be the impatient generation. We are living in a time when everything has to happen right now, and if it doesn't happen when we think it ought to happen, we become impatient. We complain, we stress, we get upset. Now, I'll admit, I'm one of the impatient generation. Let's say I'm fixing something with glue. The instructions on the tube say that for maximum strength, the glue should be left to dry for 24 hours. But I can't wait that long. I want it fixed now. I want to use it right now. So ignoring the instructions, a few hours later, I start to use the mended object, and of course, it falls apart again. So I throw it away and buy a new one. I fall hook, line, and sinker for the marketing strategies of the manufacturers. They know we're the impatient generation. They don't want us to fix things, just buy a new one. That saves all the stress and aggravation that our impatience creates in us. We live in a society of impatient people. Just stand in a long, slow-moving checkout line in a store or at the registry of motor vehicles and you soon get a taste of impatient, abusive, exasperated, and angry people. Although every now and then you hear a story that reminds us that patience does pay off and brings with it rewards. For instance, there was a man in Wales in the United Kingdom who sought to win the affection of a certain lady who lived next door, but she refused to have anything to do with him. With incredible patience and persistence, he wrote letters and slipped them under her door for 42 years. After writing 2,184 love letters, he asked for her hand in marriage. To his delight and surprise, she accepted and they finally were married. But let me ask, how patient are you with God? That might seem a strange question, but really it isn't. Have you prayed and wanted God to fix something right now? That's a silly question because we all do that, especially since we are people of the impatient generation. You want healing. You want a change in your circumstances. You want a sign that will show you what direction you should take. You want your spouse, your children to be more understanding and helpful. But you don't just want those things. You want them right now. And when the answer doesn't come as quickly as we would like, it's easy to become disheartened, disillusioned, and even angry. It seems that God wants us to keep struggling with our problems or seems to be so silent and distant. 
an instant fix-it God, now that's the kind of God we understand. He has the power and he uses it to make things right. It's easy to worship a God who gives us miraculous cures, provides a job when we suddenly find ourselves unemployed, rights the wrongs we have endured or caused. An experience of God in these circumstances just makes us want to sing and shout and praise him for his love for us. But as we are singing loudly and excitedly telling about God's goodness, there are those listening to us who have no idea what we're talking about. They can't relate to our excitement in any way. Maybe they're in the middle of some painful situation. Maybe they've been diagnosed with a serious illness. Maybe they have a sick loved one and they have prayed and prayed that God would provide a cure. Maybe they are simply feeling down and distant from God. How much more difficult is it to trust in God and worship him when God doesn't provide a quick fix that we're looking for? That leads some people to throw their hands up in disgust and give up on God, while others admit how hard life has been for them and continue by saying, there's one thing I'm certain about, God has never deserted me. He's been right there beside me in the middle of everything. In fact, I couldn't keep going on without him. In our gospel lesson today, some Greeks, converts to Judaism, want to see Jesus. Perhaps they've heard of the many signs and wonders that Jesus had done. They want to witness something miraculous. They've heard about his amazing teaching and they want to hear what he has to say. Who is this illustrious worker of miracles who stands out in the crowd? Now, just before this event, crowds had come out waving their palm branches and praising Jesus as king. And the Bible tells us the reason why they came and shouted his praises. They had witnessed Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Who wouldn't want to see this amazing man in person? Here was a man who can provide a quick fix for anything. Death, disease, sickness, blindness, paralysis, demon possession, sin, no problem. Jesus can fix it all. And so these Greeks come and they too want to see Jesus. They hear him say, the hour has now come for the Son of Man to be glorified. At long last, God will show himself. At last, Jesus will throw off the rags of his humanity and reveal his glory. At last, the hour has come when we will see God lifted up in glory. This glorious God has come to provide an instant fix to all our problems, one of which is the Romans. Yes, Jesus did fix, so to speak, many things instantly, but Jesus also struggled. He carried enormous burdens, especially when he saw the disbelief, the hardness of human hearts, and the blindness of even those who were closest to him. They couldn't understand what he was about and didn't want to hear what God's plan was for him. He felt alone, deserted by his friends. He struggled in prayer over where life's journey was taking him, as we hear in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had to walk a path that he would have given anything to avoid if there was another way. And of course he needed to do all that. He did it for our salvation. But I think he also wanted to show us what it's like to walk with God. It's not all about instant fixes. There are moments when God shows himself in dramatic ways that we are impressed and happy to talk about and proclaim God's goodness. But walking with God can also mean struggles, pain, uncertainty, confusion, bewilderment. There are times when we have to pray like Jesus, Father, not what I want, but what you want. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When Jesus talks about his glory that's about to be revealed, he isn't talking about some earth-shattering, soul-shaking experience of his godliness. Glory for him meant dying brutally and painfully. It meant the cross with all of its cruelty and shame. 
Jesus says to the disciples that to really know God is not only to see him in those exalted moments, but also to see him in the dark valleys. To illustrate this, he talks about a seed that goes into the ground and dies for a time. It is buried and nothing much happens. That's how the disciples felt on Good Friday and the day after. Jesus was dead. They were in the depths of grief and despair. They were confused and all hope had vanished. But just as the seed sprouts and brings a good harvest, likewise Jesus rose again promising that there will be a bountiful harvest of new life for all those who die in the Lord. From gloom and despair came the realization that God had not deserted his disciples and on Easter morning brought new hope and joy out of suffering and death. God's love had not abandoned Jesus or them during that awful time. My friends, in our lives, there are going to be those times when the awesomeness of God is crystal clear and we will feel really close to him. Our prayers are answered quickly and clearly. But there are also the tough times when God doesn't seem to be within earshot of what we're going through and what we're feeling. We feel like that seed that's dead and buried under a mound of dirt. We long for a quick fix, an instant solution. We of the impatient generation want God to do something now, but it doesn't happen. And just because God doesn't jump to our demands, that doesn't mean he's abandoned us. For it is just in those times that God is putting extra time into his relationship with us. He's drawing us closer to himself. He's building up our faith and trust in him. He's strengthening us for service in ways that otherwise would have been difficult or impossible without first experiencing the dark valleys. Remember, the grain of wheat may die in the ground. But with God's nurturing care, this is followed by new growth, new life, and new hope for this life and the one to come. Amen. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all now and forevermore. Amen.